All right, hello and welcome. We're so glad that you could join the Audubon Center at Riverlands today for this virtual presentation um, for Bird Friendly Fridays. So today we're gonna be talking about migration along the Mississippi Flyway. And we hope that there are some young learners at home tuning in. Um, we're gonna have a little fun with today's presentation and we've really had a fun time putting it together and we hope you enjoy it. All right, now let's get you introduced to who's going to be joining us today as we learn about migration. My name is Emily Connor and I'm an educator at the Audubon Center. And my name is Michelle Wiegand. I'm the education manager at the Audubon Center at Riverlands. Uh, and my name is Zach Stafford and I'm the AmeriCorps uh, Education Outreach. All right, and the Audubon Center is where, where we work. Um, and this center is located on the Riverlands Migratory Bird Sanctuary. And this is a really special place for animals to stop and rest. And one of the main reasons why this area is so important is because we are at the confluence of three major rivers, our Mississippi, Missouri, and Illinois, which we're gonna talk about a little bit later in this presentation. Now this sanctuary is about 3,700 acres, so it's quite large, uh, and it provides many resources to different kinds of animals. We have a diverse list of habitats as well. So as you were approaching the sanctuary, you'd be finding wetlands, bottomland forests, rivers, prairies, uh, and more. So this sanctuary provides shelter to over 300 different species of birds. Um, one, of my, one of my favorites is the trumpeter swan that you can actually see in the left-hand corner. So this photo was taken at Riverlands and it looks like they're coming down to land in the water. So today we will be talking about migration, but what do you think of when you hear the word migration? A lot of times people might say it's moving somewhere warmer, but really migration is just a seasonal movement of animals. But what kinds of animals are migrating? Think in your head of some animals that might pop up that you think that might migrate. And let's see if we have them all here. So we have birds that migrate. We have whales, even turtles, butterflies. Now this is a picture of a monarch butterfly, um, a great migrating butterfly. They actually go to Mexico. Fish, so we have salmon. They'll migrate from saltwater oceans into freshwater rivers. Even bats migrate. Eels, dragonflies, oh, not that dragonfly. Maybe we have another one up. Okay, so that dragonfly migrates. Even grandparents are known to migrate. So perhaps you know of some. So this just shows you there's a really diverse list of animals that are migrating. Um, but today we're gonna be focusing specifically on bird migration. So why do birds migrate? Um, why would a bird go through all the trouble of flying 2,000 miles and then come back again in the same year? Well, there are many reasons why birds decide to migrate. Um, something that's helpful to consider when you think about migration, um, think about the five things that animals need to survive. And so typically we all need food, water, shelter, air, and space. And so, Let's look at some examples as to why birds are migrating. It could be that they are looking for more food availability. So perhaps you are a seed eating bird and you are not finding a lot of that seed available. So that might be a reason that you need to migrate to find more food. Or maybe the climate is milder, so you're using less energy. Uh, it could be less competition. So maybe you're that seed eating bird. There's plenty of seed out there but there are a lot of other birds that are taking that food source. And so perhaps you're migrating to avoid less competition for that food source. Another reason could be the daylight hours are longer. And this can be advantageous for birds because the longer time you have uh, in the day, the more time you have to look for resources like food or perhaps collecting um, things to build a nest and things like that. 
could also be fewer predators. Perhaps the area you're in, there's a lot of dangers to you or your young. And so perhaps you need to migrate to another place that is a little bit safer for your offspring if it's nesting season. Um, and it's important to remember that there are so many different reasons why birds are migrating. And so there are many more, and perhaps you have a couple in your mind. Um, but really the most important thing to remember is that bird migration is all about energy efficiency. And so that is typically why birds are migrating either to conserve that energy and more energy sources um, and things like that. Now it's important to know that birds aren't migrating just because it's cold out. A lot of people might think it's the weather that's pushing them. Um, but many birds, for example, like a hummingbird, they're actually able to withstand freezing temperatures but they still need to migrate to get those resources that they need. So for example, um, they migrate to a place that uh, in the winter time, but it's warm all year round. Um, so why wouldn't they just stay there year round? Um, and the reason is, is because they need to maximize their access to resources. So we know kind of why birds are migrating but how do they know when to go? Do they have a calendar and it tells them what day it's time to go? Probably not, there's some other reasons. So let's look at what triggers a bird to migrate. Today there's many uh, sensory cues that birds can rely on. One of them is photoperiodism. And so that's just the lengthening and shortening of days. So I'm sure you can think back to the winter time, probably about the time you came home from school or work, it's already dark outside. But luckily right now our days are getting longer and longer. And so those different lengths of days can act as a cue to birds. It actually affects their pituitary glands and releases a hormone that causes them to start to feel a little re uh, restless, like they need to move. Uh, another could be changes in food supply or temperature. So we talked about that a little bit, but if they're noticing that they're not able to find food, that is a really good indication that it's time for them to go because if they aren't finding food, um, they, they won't be able to carry on. So that's a very important thing. Um, and then finally, a genetic predisposition. So it's the idea that birds are born with genes and in their genes can signal when it's time to migrate. All right, so they know when to go, they are triggered to migrate, but how do they not get lost along the way? Remember earlier when I mentioned birds are traveling over 2,000 miles in one season, some of those birds. So how do they know where they're going? And there can be many um, ways that birds can navigate as they're migrating. One of them is visual cues. And this is something that we as humans use as well. And so they can utilize the stars, the sun and geographic landforms. So, you know, the sun rises in the east and sets in the west that can help them um, get a sense of direction. Um, and using things like mountains and rivers can also give them a good indication. So a lot of birds choose to migrate along rivers. They act as great highways. So uh, the Mississippi River could be a great example as a direct route to the Gulf. Um, we also have the Earth's magnetic field. So it's kind of weird to think about, but birds kind of use the magnetic field as an internal compass um, that can help orient themselves. Um, but they could also use weather patterns. And so weather patterns can help prepare birds for migration. Um, and it's important to consider that sometimes this could actually delay their migration or detour them. But a lot of times it could help speed up the process and direct them on their way. All right, so while we've talked about all of these animals that are migrating, we, we should probably discuss the different types of migrators that we have. So we're gonna use a couple of local birds that we get here year round um, as some examples to those different types of migrators. And the first one is our complete migrant. Um, so a great example of that is our ruby-throated hummingbird. And our ruby-throated hummingbird is going to spend their late spring and summer in Missouri. Personally, I was very excited. I had my first hummingbird at my feeder just a few days ago, so they are, they are now in the St. Louis area. Um, now, as it begins to uh, turn to fall and winter, these birds are going to be migrating to the Gulf of Mexico um, and spend their time in Central America. Uh, a fun fact about the 
ruby-throated hummingbird is that they could actually fly across the entire Gulf of Mexico without stopping. And so this bird is really great at conserving energy and traveling long distances. Um, another, on the other end of that, we have our non-migrants. And so these are birds that aren't going to be migrating from one place to another. They're typically going to stay in one type of habitat year round. And so another great example is our American goldfinch. When you see this picture, it's probably a bird you've seen before, our yellow finches, um, because they're very common and we can find them in the winter, we can find them in the summer. I just saw one in my backyard yesterday. And so um, this is a very common bird. And so they're staying in Missouri year round. The reason they're not migrating is because they're able to find access to those resources that they need. They're able to find sources of energy so they don't have that trigger to migrate. And then finally, we have one on the in between. So we have our partial migrants. A great example would be our bald eagle. Now partial migrants uh, really just means that about a, fr a fraction of that population is going to be migrating while the rest would stay in a single habitat year round. So we have some eagles um, that would be more like our ruby-throated hummingbird and they will migrate fully in a year. Or we could have bald eagles that are more like the goldfinch and they decide to stay in the same area year round. So we do have bald eagles that live in Missouri year round and they nest here. But in the winter time, you may have noticed we get a huge influx of bald eagles um, as we are receiving a lot of those migrating birds that like to spend their winters along the Mississippi River. Now let's take a look at our flyways. So perhaps you've heard of a flyway before, perhaps you haven't. Um, think of a flyway as kind of like a bird highway. It's a geographic area that birds migrate through. So many birds will take the same paths to get from one place to another. Um, and if you look at the map here, these are our four flyways that we have in the United States. So we have the Pacific, the Central, the Mississippi, and the Atlantic. So let's take a look specifically at our Mississippi flyway. So as you can see, the nice red star there is where the Audubon Center is located in the St. Louis area. Um, and this is our Mississippi flyway in green. Um, now the Mississippi flyway uh, is a really important flyway. In fact, 60% of all migratory songbirds in North America like to use our flyway. Yes. Uh, and then in addition to that, we get 40% of our waterfowl are using the Mississippi flyway. And so this is supporting over 325 different species of birds. And as you look at this map here, it stretches across many states. So its corridors are quite large. So while you don't, maybe you, perhaps you don't live in the, in the St. Louis area, um, you are still, could play a huge role in this flyway here as birds are migrating. Um, so why do you think birds decide to use the Mississippi flyway over others? Let's take a look at why this is such a favorable uh, flyway. And so, um, you know, the Mississippi flyway is relatively flat. We are in the Midwest. So um, typically when you think of the Midwest, you think of agricultural fields and farmlands because we do have generally flat land. Um, so there aren't going to be major landforms like mountains. Um, in addition to that, it provides so many resources because we are at in the St. Louis region at the confluence of three major rivers, the Mississippi Flyway has one of the largest rivers um, in North America. And so this river is providing water, it's providing food and shelter. So that's another important indicator. And it is also a direct route to the Gulf of Mexico. So that ruby throated hummingbird has a nice pathway for its um, overwintering areas. Um, and so birds can just follow the Mississippi River um, as they're migrating. And so these are some reasons why it's so much more favorable. Now, why aren't they using other flyways? We could consider perhaps mountain ranges. And so if we think about the Pacific and Central flyways, there are a lot of very tall landforms. Um, and so it can cause birds to use more energy as they're migrating to fly over these large landforms. And that's another reason why they might choose the Mississippi flyway because it is relatively very flat. Um, and so since we've learned a little bit more about the Mississippi flyway migration and the different kinds of birds, uh, I'm gonna turn it over to Michelle.
All right, thanks, Emily. So um, as, as Emily said, now that we've learned a little bit more about migration and why birds do it, who's doing it, um, we wanna invite you all to come along on a migration journey of your own. Uh, so as birds migrate, they face many hazards uh, as well as things that can help them along their way. So we're gonna explore some of those now. And we want you, we want to enjoy you or in, invite you all to become a bird with us um, and try your hand at migration along the Mississippi. So we actually uh, decided to get in character that, for this um, and we encourage you guys to do the same at home. Um, so as we were planning, Zach became a Northern Mockingbird. Emily became a Blue Jay. And I became, of course, the majestic bald eagle. So realistic. Um, so uh, feel free to take a moment and uh, get on your best bird hat, best bird shirt, whatever you want. And then I want you guys to close your eyes and imagine that you're a bird starting out on your migration. So let's imagine that you spent um, a whole night flying um, overnight and now you're starting to get tired, you're starting to get hungry and you need a place to stop. Um, so let's see where your first stop is going to be uh, along the migration. All right, so luckily you have landed in a backyard that's been planted full of native plants. And native plants can provide a lot of resources for birds during their migration for a lot of different reasons. Um, native plants provide things like seed, uh, this is, a, again, our American goldfinch that's sitting on one of their favorite foods, the purple coneflower. Here you can see uh, the goldfinch um, feeding on the seeds of the purple coneflower um, in the fall. Native plants also provide uh, fruit. They can provide nectar, shelter, and especially insects. And insects are really important for birds because 96% of terrestrial birds in North America actually feed their, in, feed their young insects. So it's a really important source of protein for young birds. And so if we don't have insects in an area, we're not gonna have birds. One example of that is that a clutch of chickadees requires 9,000 caterpillars in just the 16 days between when they hatch and when they're fledging, when they leave the nest. So that's 9,000 caterpillars. So it's a ton of insects. Um, and so they're very important for birds and their development. Um, and native plants specifically are an important part of that equation because native plants are plants that grow naturally in the region. They, they have been there for many, many years. And because of that, they've evolved alongside native insect populations. Uh, whereas if you go to many of your kind of typical big box garden centers, uh, while they might have some really beautiful flowering plants that you can put in your yard, if they didn't, if they aren't from this region originally, if they're from different parts of the world, um, they didn't evolve alongside the insects that are, are native to this area. And so they'll probably have some defense mechanisms um, that make um, them impossible to eat. Um, by our native insects. Um, so they won't provide a whole lot of uh, resources then for our native, uh, native birds or the birds migrating through our area. So this is great. Luckily for you, st you stopped here in this backyard, you got lots of food and you're ready to move on to your next leg of your journey. But at your next stop, there is a hazard ahead. So as you're leaving um, that backyard, um, you do face the hazard of windows nearby. Windows can cause a lot of problems for birds. Um, they are one of the leading causes of bird death each year, and between 100 million and 100, bir 100 billion birds are lost annually to win window collisions. Um, and this is because windows are everywhere, and they can be clear or they can be reflective. Um, so if they're clear, a bird just might not see it and try to fly right through it. Um, but if they're reflective, it might look like this, um, where it's actually reflecting habitat that's across from the window. 
And this can be a really big problem for birds because um, if a bird perhaps um, sees a predator and is trying to get away from the predator, they might try to fly into um, what they think is safe haven in that window reflection. Um, and they can um, become injured, they can get brain damage, and it ca can even cause death. So this is actually what it could look like if you have a window collision at your home. Um, but sometimes they go unnoticed. It might not leave a mark um, or it might just leave a small patch of feathers. However, fortunately for your bird, um, you were able to avoid the windows and you're able to continue flying on. But um, while you were able to avoid windows, you have become ill. So your bird has um, developed lead poisoning. However, there was a wildlife rehabilitation center nearby. So let's learn more by watching this video about um, what lead poisoning can do to birds and a little bit about um, what can cause lead poisoning in bird populations. What I would really like the public to know is that this is so preventable for a bald eagle in this day and age to get lead poisoning. There's two ways that they can get it, and that's eating off of a gut pile that where a deer has been gutted, or a deer was not recovered after it was shot. And this is at the time of the year where we mostly see eagles coming in at this time of the year where they're gonna have lead poisoning. Um, the other way that they can get it is through fishermen using lead sinkers and um, jigs. And like I said, it's so preventable because we now have non-lead ammunition and fishing gear. So I just, you know, people, whatever you put out there in the environment, it's gonna come back and, and affect our wildlife. And as my veterinarian said to me the other day, she says, can you feel how bad the people in Flint must feel today knowing their children have lead poisoning? It's going to be the same kind of treatment what you saw today. All right, so while your bird did become Ill, Ill luckily there was this wildlife rehabilitator uh, nearby and they were able to help um, get your bird Beth, back to health. We'll talk a little bit later about some of the effects of lead poisoning on birds. Um, but for now, let's continue on our journey. So luckily, um, as, you, um, as you've rested and you've healed from the lead poisoning illness, um, you do have um, some strong winds behind you that help you fly a little easier as you go. So you're going to continue on your journey, but next you are actually stopped again. And this time you are caught by some wildlife researchers in a net. So let's find out what this is about at this stop. So the work I'm doing with the bird banding is up above campus on Skyline Drive. What we do is we'll set up mist nets at our locations and check them every 20 minutes and whatever birds we catch, we'll pull them out of the net and they get a band put on them. The data that we are getting is being used for current research that we're looking at. We're looking at a lot of species abundance. I think the research we're doing is important because it can help us save populations. If we can determine now that they're in a decline, we can make conscious efforts to change that. It's been something that I've really enjoyed and learned a lot from, um, something I didn't ever think I was going to do, but it's been a huge, huge interest and love of mine now. I think it's a lot of fun. I mean, I'm really into to doing research, to work with birds and handle birds and, and things like that, I think is a ton of fun and the experience is great. Great. So while you were caught by this net and researchers um, did band your leg, it wasn't harmful. So you've received a band on your leg and now you're going to be contributing to science. Um, and scientists are going to be able to understand a little bit more about species abundance in that area. So let's continue. As you continue on, you are starting to get pretty tired and hungry, 
and you are looking for what we call a stopover location, a place to stop and rest um, and be safe for a while, get some resources you need. But as you approach, um, you, you've done this journey before. So you have some favorite stopover locations where you go every year on your migration. Um, but as you approach and you get closer, you realize that something is amiss. So as you get closer, you realize that there has been habitat loss. And habitat loss can look a number of different ways for birds and other animals. It might look like this where an area has been completely deforested um, and no longer provides the resources it once did. Or it could look like this, where an, an area has been completely converted. Um, if it might have used to have a lot of um, different types of habitat and um, biodiversity, it has now been converted into primarily single crop agricultural fields. Um, which don't provide a whole lot of resources for birds and can also pose some um, pollu pollutants for birds um, along the way as well. It could look like this, where it's been mostly um, paved over and there are now buildings and lights that lot cause lots of light pollution. Or habitat loss can look like this, where there might still be some natural resources like water and plants, but it's become so polluted that it's unsuitable for birds. So fortunately, you have a little bit of energy left and you're able to continue to fly on and try to find an alternative place to rest. And luckily, you are able to find a schoolyard where some children have put out some bird feeders for you. So you are able to stop and get some food. They even put in a pond where you're able to get some water and you're able to spend a little bit of time resting um, and getting those resources you need to store up um, for the rest of your migration journey. However, it's not long before you realize that there is a predator near. And this time, um, you're facing the hazard of outdoor cats. So outdoor cats, um, cats can be the actual number one direct human cause threat to birds in the US and Canada. In the United States alone, approximately 2.4 billion birds are killed each year by cats. Um, so they cause a whole lot of problems for bird populations. Um, but fortunately for you, you were able to see the predator ahead and you were able to avoid it and fly on on your journey. But at your next stop, you weren't so lucky. And as you were looking for some food, you did get caught up in some fishing line. So fishing line and other trash can provide a lot of hazards for birds. As you can see here, um, it might get caught in their beak. A fishing hook might actually get caught in their beak or in their skin. Um, the fishing line could get wrapped around their legs and it immobilizes them. Um, or it could even get caught around their bill like this American white pelican um, and prevent them from eating. But luckily, um, there were some good Samaritans nearby and they were able to set you free so you're able to continue on your journey. But up ahead, there are some power lines which can sometimes pose a threat to birds on their migration. But let's find out more through this video um, about what some people have done to help prevent collisions with power lines. installing about a thousand swan diverters, uh, which looks like this, um, on our high tension power line out here in uh, uh, near the Riverlands Migratory Bird Sanctuary. Um, the diverters are designed to make the power lines more visible, uh, particularly to trumpeter swans. I'm an aerial lineman. 
Sometimes it can be a hassle with, um, depending on how rough the wind is, uh, just makes our job take a little bit longer. All right, great. So while there were power lines ahead, um, people have done some creative things to make power lines more visible to, to birds like you. So luckily, um, you were flying near the Riverlands Migratory Bird Sanctuary, where these power lines, uh, these power line swan diverters, have been installed to make the power lines more visible. And so that means you are able to avoid the power lines, and you have now arrived at Riverlands Migratory Bird Sanctuary. So here, you're able to take some uh, some time to rest. You can get some food. You can hang out with your friends. Um, and this might be your final destination or it could just be a place that you're stopping along your way. But whatever it is, Riverlands has provided you a, a crucial stop along your journey to get the resources that you need. So as you all can see, Migration is not easy for birds or other animals. Um, there's a lot of challenges, but there are a lot of things that we can do um, at home and in our neighborhoods to make a difference for birds. So I'm gonna pass it off now to Zach, who's actually gonna share some of those things with you. All right, thank you, Michelle. Um, yeah, but as, as Michelle said that, uh, fortunately enough, we are, we don't have to go on such perilous journeys to um, get to one place or another twice a year. Um, unfortunately enough, um, humans are sort of kind of the issues with, with some of these problems as, as we've seen. Um, but here are some ways to help mitigate those effects, um, as well as um, create a bird, healthy bird habitat uh, for some of our local and passing through birds. So one way we can do this is through window decals. Uh, as Michelle said, window, uh, window collisions are some of the biggest causes of birds um, to strike, to um, go across, to hit the things, because a lot of times they either see the reflection of, the, of a tree or they go through thinking that they can go through it um, to a tree on the other side. One way we can prevent these is through um, arts and crafts. Um, as we can see from this video, this is one way that you can create a bird decal to stop and help break up those reflections uh, to help stop window collisions. Yeah, so as you can see there, um, that's one way of making a window decal for you. Uh, it can be through an online coloring sheet, uh, stickers that you might have, anything to help break up those reflections uh, that is going to stop help, uh, that will help uh, create, um, help divert window collisions. Another way we can do it is by planting native plants. Uh, Native plants, as Michelle talked about, are crucial to birds. They can provide habitat, but they can also provide a food source uh, for birds. Um, up to caterpillars love some of our local native plants, and um, they are cru a crucial food source. To find out what those plants are, um, you can always go to Audubon and look for those, uh, or you can go to a local nursery where somebody there can help you. For Missouri uh, and Illinois, some of the more popular uh, native plants are purple coneflower and common milkweed. Uh, these are great uh, to plant into your yards. Uh, we provide at the Audubon Center, we provide seed bombs that are have seeds from common milkweed and purple coneflower um, that are 100% free and can be used to just throw out to your yard and um, they'll disintegrate over time and eventually um, start producing some of these native plants. Next, uh, what we can do are feeders. Feeders are another great way um, to help the local area. They are probably some of the more obvious and more um, impactful ways you can 
find birds um, and affect them in a positive manner. Um, but they could also be some of the more uh, costly um, measures. Sometimes it does cost more to uh, maintain a feeder or to get a feeder started. Um, and so it's some of those pros and cons that you have to weigh with what best suits you. Um, and as we can see here in this, in our next video, um, some important how these uh, bird feeders actually impact, impact local uh, birds. Yeah, so as you can see, we had a local bird. He was uh, feeding away. I'm sure he got a, a good lunch, a good snack in uh, before he was he was going to move on or, or continue with his day. Um, and that's just one way that feeders are, are pretty obvious of what they do. But next, we have to be smart about what we feed birds. Um, a common misconception about what we can feed birds is bread. And while bread offer, does offer a full stomach, um, it has no nutritional supplements. Uh, this also goes with things such as salty foods, such as chips and other snacks. Um, but the best thing we can do that if you don't have bird seed and you still wanna help feed some local birds, some other things that we can do are use things such as seeds or berries or peanut butter or Crisco um, and other vegetation that are gonna be safe for those local birds to eat and get the nutrients they need uh, for when they have to eventually go down um, and, went and fatten up for the winter. To other, see what other kind of foods also, just in addition to see what other foods that we have, uh, go to Audubon and, and they do have uh, some local great things to what to help feed birds. Another thing we can do is uh, keep cats indoors. So as Michelle also mentioned that cats are really the big main problem when it comes to killing birds. Um, it's in the billions. So to eliminate some of these risks is to try to keep your cat inside. Um, and if you can't do that, if you have a more outdoor cat, to try to keep eyes on them as well. Um, some of these measures can be included. It might be more specific to your pet because ultimately you're gonna know what's best. But we provide to do these just in order to not only to help stop killing birds, but also to make sure you don't get an unpleasant surprise at your doorstep one day. Um, another thing that we can do that might uh, apply to some people, but not everybody, um, is to switch from lead sinkers and bullets to other metals that we have. Um, as mentioned in the video, uh, lead poisoning is big for more, more charismatic birds. So things like trumpeter swans and eagles uh, will eat these, whether directly, uh, whether it's trumpeter swans um, eating at the bottom of a lake, pulling up vegetation and actually digesting sinkers or if it's through eagles who eat a fish or eat a deer, as the video mentioned, um, and then digest that lead. Um, you can tell if a bird has lead poisoning, if they're very lethargic, they could be walking kind of funny um, and just not acting right. So um, these can ultimately be fixed, but sometimes um, and often, too often, uh, it does lead in death. So if you can make those switch, that's another very impactful way to, to help uh, these birds to make sure that they do not get uh, lead poisoning. And last, but certainly not least, is to just uh, pick up around the uh, pick up the trash around you and, and make sure not to litter. Uh, it's another very obvious thing to do, but a lot of times, as Michelle said, that a lot of these birds confuse it for nesting material or for food, um, and and will get caught up and tied around, and it can affect them harmfully if it doesn't kill them. Um, so we can see just an example here of how to the do's and the don'ts of when it comes to, to picking up trash. Yeah, so uh, that's enough of the videos. Uh, I promise you won't be subjected to any more. Um, but those are the main sort of causes of, uh, of what we can really do as individuals and as com a community uh, to make these migration journeys not so uh, perilous and, and more positive for them. Um, and with that, we will now go into uh, any questions that we have um, that maybe we can help with you or answer for you. So if you have any questions, 
um, make sure to comment uh, and we will do so. I had a question, Zach. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, what were you feeding that big bird at your feeder? Yeah, so uh, as you can tell, we have uh, a lot of um, black sunflower seeds in there. And so that's what we were the main feed we were using. Um, but I, I heard that that bird specifically, um, I heard that his favorite snack was like uh, hamburgers. So um, it's just, uh, it's probably a little unusual, but, but yeah, so. Yeah, the Cardinals love the black sunflower at my yeah. Uh, theater. Yeah, we have we have about uh, six, seven, six to seven male Cardinals uh, every morning that come in and duel over it, basically. So, <laughs> yeah, I've had uh, the black sunflower seed and some crackled corn, and I've had a lot of rose-breasted grosbeaks. I had one indigo bunting. Um, and just tons of sparrows too. They love the crackled corn. So, and I live in uh, South City. So they, I mean, I think putting out feeders beforehand, I had never seen any of those birds in my backyard, but after putting those feeders out, I've really seen a huge increase in all these new birds that I never really get to see. So it's been really exciting, especially being at home to, to uh, view those birds and watch them enjoy that food so yeah it's it's definitely been something that I've kept an eye out more you know now from working from home uh, we do have a question um, that I see and it, it is for me and it says uh, there was a bird box in one of the the back part of the videos um, it was for blue jays um, unfortunately uh, we have not had any um, come and nest it is it's pretty empty but uh, it did get some activity because there were some um, bristles that we have from the tree that were inside. So uh, unfortunately, no, but, you know, there's always next year. So. And it looks like that might be all the questions that we have right now. All right. Great. So we can keep going. Um, so we just wanted to give you guys a reminder. Uh, you can tune in next Friday at 2 p.m. for another awesome Bird Friendly Friday presentation. Um, and we will be talking about nests at home and at Riverlands. Um, in fact, our conservation science associate, Tara Holman, has just spotted our first uh, nesting pair of kestrels on the sanctuary this week. So it's very exciting. Um, and we're really looking forward to seeing those eggs starting to hatch and seeing the growth of those young. So be sure to tune in next week if you want to learn more about the types of nests that we're having in our area right now that you could see at home, as well as an update on some of those projects that we've been working on at the River Joy Birds Sanctuary. So once again, we just wanted to thank you all for joining us today for this Bird Friendly Friday. Uh, we hope that you learned a little bit more about migration along the Mississippi Flyway and how you can help. And so we really do believe that it's people like you that can really make a difference for birds. And so we want you to pick just one thing that you can do to help birds and to go out and do it today. Uh, and for that, we wanna thank you. Um, so we hope to see you guys next Friday at 2 p.m. And we really hope you have a great weekend with this awesome weather. Thank you, everyone. Have a good day. Bye.